ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, this is Cheats, and you're listening to the Cheats Movement podcast. Uh, today is special. 2022 is starting out with a bang. I have a very, very special guest. I'm so excited to have him on the program and have this discussion. His name is Xavier Shrugs. He is a former professional baseball player. Um, he's played several years over a decade, but uh, got his debut with the St. Louis Cardinals. He hit his first home run with the Miami Marlins. Then he was, again, an absolute monster in the Korean Baseball League for two seasons uh, and also played uh, played in, in Mexico as well, played a bunch of summer league. Um, he's a pro, man. He's a professional baseball player. And like we said, with the, with the tagline, more than an athlete, he is – and the epitome of that, uh, Xavier, since he's uh, hung up the cleats, has done amazing work in the media space. He's done amazing work mentoring youth. Um, he's even signed on as a diversity consultant for his uh, old club, the St. Louis Cardinals. Um, he has just done so, so much, and he's just getting started. And that's the exciting part about it. So, Xavier, welcome to the program. X, as they call you. What's good, my man? Hey, thanks so much for having me. Uh, appreciate all the kind things you said about me, but uh, yeah, I gotta bring you in yeah. right, man. I gotta bring you in right. I got to, and there and you, you go. and you are make well, me feel special. Hey, man, you're well deserving of it, and you've done such such cool stuff. So I could start with a number of things. I could start with so many things, but this is where I want to start with it because I believe you are in such a unique position now. And what you're doing now, even the way you talk about the game of baseball, you are making baseball culturally cool in your descriptions. <laughs> and, and that's important. It's you, you like I go around looking and no disrespect to anyone. I grew up loving Joe Morgan. RIP. Mm. I love Joe Morgan. Yeah. Joe Morgan didn't make the game culturally cool on Sunday night baseball. He made he made it. He made the game watching enjoyable. I love mm -hmm. Harold Reynolds. I love him, but it's a different, what we're seeing now. And I think the wave that you usher in as you make the game exciting to a generation of folks that can walk into a middle school classroom or a high school classroom and be like, man, did you see Fernando Tatis or Vlad Jr. Or look at this, look at this clip. And yeah. so I want to start asking you where we are. It's very well documented where we are with black American young players in particular playing in major league baseball. I think we're down to about 8%. And that's actually a little bit on the, on the slight increase um, where we were in, you know, throughout the seventies and late eighties, we were about 20%. Right. What do you think? How, how do you look at a situation like that and say, why do you think that kind of happened over the years, especially in years where you started playing and fell in love with the game? And then what can we do? I know there's always a lot of attention and a lot of efforts and everybody looks at the numbers, but are there real tangible things that we can do to increase, especially young black American players to, to play baseball and, and move up through the ranks? Yeah, no, I think you, you hit me hard, you know, starting off with <laughs> this bad, first one, man. man. I just look, look, look. <laughs> I, I know if there's anybody I can ask, I can ask you. <laughs> No, and I think that's what's special about our game, right? Like, we have to take a step back and look at our game from an international perspective. And you have some of the best athletes from all over different countries coming to our, to, coming to our America, our pastime, our game to play here. And so for, 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 to answer your question, I think one thing that's changed is our it changes our perspective of the game. I think that we're not embracing the idea that there's so many different backgrounds and so many different experiences within our game. And I, when you look at our culture, when you look at even African American numbers dwindling within our game, we have to start celebrating that more. We have to be able to say, okay, our game is evolving as far as personalities in the game, as far as Cool, as far as coolness in the world, as far as pop culture, hip hop culture, all those things, 
How can we take what's so special about football, basketball, and bring those things back into baseball? Because when I was watching, I'm looking at commercials with Ken Griffey Jr. I'm looking at commercials with Kenny Lofton doing his thing, Albert Bell. I'm looking at Frank Thomas, the big hurt. Like, where are those commercials nowadays? But I think part of it is the fact that not only is it dealt on the marketing side, I think it's dealt also on the player side. So I think the players have to take more responsibility. And I think this is what's great about the players alliance is now we're getting players diving back into the communities that we hadn't really had before. If you go talk to a lot of those players alliance guys that have dove back into the communities and I've done the same thing here in Tampa, you start to realize I'm not doing this enough. I'm not going back and showing these kids and showing these communities. And it's not just black kids, right? It's everybody in, in a lot of these areas that don't get the resources that don't get the opportunities. Like this is why I decided to play because I saw someone that looked like me who was able to get to where they needed to go. So I think there's a, a few things to answer your question is a marketing standpoint. Yes. From the, from a, um, from baseball is behind when it comes to basketball and football because they have a tough time figuring out how to market to the young players, young generations of our game. And two, the players of today have to take responsibility and go back into the communities and show them why the game is so cool to them. So this is great. I, I agree with you a hundred percent on both angles, on both angles. Is there anything in your experience that you feel like Major League Baseball as an organization can do or even the Players Association? Because it's interesting. I feel like a lot of this when we talk about the increasing the decreasing number of black Americans, but the mm -hmm. increasing numbers of minorities around. And um, I feel like a lot of times it does fall on the feet of major league baseball and that's still like i feel like there's there's i mean i look and i see how major league baseball has started initiatives and they have the late great henry aaron you know what i mean they've got rbi mm -hmm. but it always seems to find that it doesn't it, it hasn't been meeting that that disconnect and i think people like yourself and what you're talking about active players going back in the communities doesn't even have to be mlb players right it could be just there's tons of minor league baseball players all over the place, but going right. back in the community and being, being a part of that, do you, do you feel like it's almost too much of a task for like a major league baseball per se? Or do you think if they look at the lens differently, they could do more? It has to be looking at the lens differently. There's, there's no, and there's no fighting the idea that MLB can do so much more, yeah. but look, you you're not going to get the same response if we know oh all of a sudden we're down to seven percent african-american we need to go do something about right. that right no that's not authentic that's not the way it's good that's not the way to get the response that you want that's not going to get the excitement that if you if you're if you're doing it because there's some type of uh, initiative behind it that has nothing to do with actually garnishing and, and really making a development within these communities to allow them to say, this is the game for me, then there's no reason to do it. That's what I think is so special about like even the changing the lens of the players Alliance, because yes, we understand that the game is dwindling for young African-Americans, but I think now you're starting to get an idea of perspective from the players Alliance. Like, man, we're not, this isn't just about the numbers, right? This is more about actually making players, young, young communities and these communities that don't have the resources understand why this is our pastime, why you, you start to dive into, I, I know I'm going off a little bit. You no, no, you're not. You're into, right on target. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the Negro leagues and learning from guys like Bob Kendrick, who have their own podcast now like when you start to learn what's so important about our game from the past, like then you start to realize how you affect the future of our game. And so there's so many different outlets that are doing it authentically. What I'm saying is MLB has to figure out a way to not just do it because of the numbers. Mm -hmm. They got to do it because it's the, it's, it's right for our game. And I think that's what they've done so well in the Dominican. Think about that. You know, there's so much talent in the Dominican, why not go invest so much money in the Dominican and bring the, we could be doing the same things here and here and here more and more. You're doing it over in Korea. You're doing it over in Europe. Like 
continue to find ways to do it here because the talent is already here. And sure. I think that's and that's what's special about our game. And I think as long as we continue to figure out ways to, to dive into that and do it for the right reasons, I think you get a better response from our communities. I think you're 100 percent correct. I think it's interesting because um, obviously I'm a bit of a Negro League historian myself. At, at a, I'm not look, I'm Love not it. nowhere near uh, the level of uh, the, the, the wonderful leader that you've mentioned, Bob Kendricks, over at the uh, at the hit. Um, the museum over in Kansas city. But the interesting thing is, and I, and I think we have to figure this out because when you really start to look at growing the game and what's happened, especially overseas with the, uh, the baseball academies, um, you know, there's all of these different layers and different factors. And it's so uh, it's, it's really interesting to look at, but it's also very complicated. Right. So yeah. what happens is back in, obviously in the late forties, it was a very similar setup to what you see at baseball academies to what you saw with black players in the Negro leagues. There was no, yeah. there were, there were kind of ready-made players, right? There was a little bit of a, um, you know, they signed them to free agent contracts and they, they didn't have to be kind of, kind of groomed in the system uh, that we see now, which I'm starting, look, I'm starting to learn as I follow more global soccer that our draft system is by far, it's a, it's a very American thing to go through middle school, high school, college, like you did at UNLV, mm -hmm. get drafted twice and then, you know, sign with a team as opposed right. to like a globally in soccer, they identify a 12 year old and he's on Barcelona's farm club and get pulled up to the, when he's 18 years old. I say all that, uh, like you said, I say all that to say it's interesting because what I think one of the things that has happened is that a black American players have been put into the system that is basically just a universal American system. So whether they have the means to play summer ball, whether they have the means to play travel ball, whether they have the, the you know, the leadership in mm -hmm. their, in their youth development or leadership in their high school um, to, to get on the map, right. To get on the map and, and play in these places like the Cape Cod league or something, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So they're in that system while there's still kind of the, the baseball academy systems where you can go and say, hey, he's 14 years old in the Dominican Republic. We can we can watch him and sign him. Right. You know right. what I mean? It's like right. so there's all of these things. And I, and I, but I think you've hit it on the head. Uh, and the one thing you did, uh, there's a couple of things you hit on right on the head, but the authenticity of doing it because you realize the end result is better for our game mm -hmm. and better for society. And I think that's one of the things when we always look at all of these initiatives around all the sports and everybody's like, why doesn't the Rooney rule work? Like, uh, you know, these black coaches yeah. in the NFL are interviewing. And yeah. I think you've actually hit it. They're interviewing without the often authentic chance to get the job. So they right. can check a box off and say, oh, yeah, we got the Rooney rule. And Rooney rule has done some good, but right. it's not an overwhelmingly result that they want simply because of exactly what you said, X. I think you've hit it on the head. Yeah. And I think an example of that within major league baseball, and it's not an African-American, but I sit back this year and watch the Cardinals. Um, they fired their manager in Mike Schilt, but then they hired a, a, a minority manager in uh, Oliver Marmel. And we're talking about a, a Cardinals history of, you know, not having the minority no, manager. And, not at and all. we understand the history of the Cardinals and, and some of the backlash they've gotten for kind of being on that side when it comes to their team, when it comes to that culture, um, that organization. And I think what it does is it tells you if even the one of the teams that's been almost in that one shaded area of not being a part of that, um, it tells you that they went out and found the best guy available for the job, no matter the skin color, no matter the background, whatever. And I think that's got, got to be more of the thought process when it comes to all of our sports. But just if it's the right person for the job, it's the right person, you know? You, that's a great segue. You, uh, you took on a consultant role uh, with the Cardinals. Am I correct, am I correct yes, about this? Yes, yeah. About uh, basically, you know, kind of diversity, inclusion, and equity, all the stuff that happened around 2020 in society, obviously impacted baseball, but you took on this role as a consultant for your old club. And now I guess you're a couple of things that were fascinating about this. You actually, correct me if I'm wrong, but you actually got training at Cornell, is it? To yes. do this particular type of work? Yeah. Now, yes. now brother, 
<laughs> Again, ladies and gentlemen, a UNLV college baseball player drafted, you know, career that spans over a decade. And now you see what was happening and you had a passion to take classes, not just at any school, but Cornell to talk about diversity. Uh, tell me a little bit about what led you to that path, that decision, and also what type of work have you done, are doing, and hope to accomplish in this role with the Cardinals? Yeah, man, I appreciate you asking. So um, 2020 was the same for me as a lot of other people, um, not only when it came to the pandemic, but I'm looking around and I'm seeing all the political issues that are going on in our world. I'm seeing um, the racial issues um, and just feeling like our country seems so divided. And I wanted to learn more about kind of before I before I spoke on something, I wanted to learn more about it uh, via education. And and I talked to my dad and he's 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 been in human resources for a long time and mentioned, hey, maybe you should go study at Cornell, take some classes with Cornell. And I did that and really started to understand that, you know, I looked around and I was like, is there anybody that that is really helping these players when it comes to specific organizations? Um, to figure out what we're talking about when we're com- when we're talking about uh, racial uh, you know issues and in our country being divided on certain uh, certain things when it comes to um, political stuff and when it comes to speaking out when it comes to your platform when it comes to your influence as a player and asked around and I most specifically asked the Cardinals if there was someone that they had like that that could be able to talk to players coaches staff whoever it may be and they didn't have that and and I said this is a time when teams really need it and and I presented the idea to uh John Moselak and he was right on board with it um even during a time when they were firing people not hiring people within the organization and I think he understood the need for it and and I think for me, I understand not only the need for the team, but also I looked at there was a Players Alliance group text message going on. And a lot of players were so confused as to, um, you know, what they were going to do when it came to taking unity uh, on certain issues. And I said, there's got to be people that help them. You know, it, there's got to be people that allow them to understand what's going on in their communities, allow them to understand what's going on. Uh, culturally. Uh, and so I decided to do that with the Cardinals. And luckily, I, I had a guy in John Mozalak who was very adamant about doing it. And it's been a blessing. And then to answer your second question, I think some of the biggest things that we've been able to do is the Cardinals have a great um, application called Teamworks. And been able to, and I'm someone that's created a lot of content, but I was able to create content for the players, major league and minor league players, coaches and staff um, via all different types of ways. So an example is a podcast. So I would do a podcast with different people within the organization. Mm -hmm. So whether that be Willie McGee talking about some of the issues that he went through coming up in the system as a, as a young player, um, some of the racial issues that he had to go through, um, you know, what advice he would give to players today. Same thing with sitting down with the Cardinals communications director. Uh, what are some of the things I should be using my platform on, on social media for? What are some of the things I shouldn't be doing? Um, So being able to provide this information to these players, same thing with their communities that they're going to. A lot of these minor league players are going to communities they're not familiar with. Mm -hmm. How do we give them the resources to understand how to live a day, live everyday life in Memphis, Tennessee? If I'm from San Diego, California, and I got to all of a sudden uproot and go to Memphis, Tennessee, that's going to be a culture shock. So being able to do those things via the application, via videos, you know, you know, this better than anyone, everybody. Uh, consumes the content differently. So being able to a- add a wide array of content um, within for the players and, and the coaches and staff, that was big. X, how did you navigate throughout your career? Because as anyone that's played baseball at the level that you play, played baseball with, there, we know that there's a lot of, like you said, international influence in the game, even going through the minor leagues. But I bet you, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but I bet you there are plenty of times where you looked around and said, I'm the only brother in this room. Yeah. <laughs> nobody 100%. has the how nobody has the experience that I have. Like they're not going through the same experience. And one of the things that I uh, I marvel when I go back and read history and the history of baseball and I read about 
you know, Dusty Baker and 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 knowing that they had a Henry Aaron. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. there there there's there was always at this period up until probably around the time that you were really getting going, there was always like kind of older the older statesmen that you could kind of that was usually always yeah. around. But you yeah. probably, like I said, came up in a situation where you were looking around a lot of times, whether it was from travel ball to UNLV, like looking around and being like, yo, I'm the only one. How did you navigate some of the challenges that you're trying to now help navigate for, for others? Man, it, it, it was tough, man. And I think I'm so grateful that I had the right people in my corner, right? Notably my parents, um, some mentors. I had a guy like David Justice that I could talk to growing up. Um, multiple guys, t- t- Tony Gwynn was another guy. Um, so I had some people that out that were in, was in my corner growing up, but it's always a struggle because like you said, you look around and you're like, man, some, some of these guys are not going through the same experiences as me. And I think that's what kind of shaped, um, obviously who I am today, but, um, I really tried to, you know, understand the fact that just because, I don't have necessarily everybody that I need as far as right next to me. Um, I still have to be able to lean on the people that I know that are going to help me. And uh, I think if you can get the people in your right corner, in your corner, um, that's big. But another thing too, was I think you meant, and you mentioned this and reminded me of this is even my time in the minor leagues going with the Cardinals. I remember there were other players I would call other black players Hey man, like we just had dinner with, uh, with Willie Mays. He got mm. all the brothers together and we were just talking about some of the things. And I remember the same thing that, uh, Dusty Baker, um, uh, I was home, uh, homeboy with the Braves, the infield coach. I'm now I'm forgetting Terry his name. Pendleton? Um, no, no. Um, he used to be a, he used to be the manager. Um, uh, uh I can't, I, I, it'll come to me, but okay. like different guys. Right. So, and oh, I didn't have Rob that. Washington. Yeah, Washington, Washington, yeah. My bad. I can't, so, can't no. forget Ron. I was, yeah, like, I was like, hold uh, on now. There's not too many over there. Let me figure it out. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so. Uh, that's dope, man. That's I don't know dope. I blanked on that. Yeah, so nah, I would have dope. guys. That, so I thought that was really cool, but I didn't have that. So I really tried to, like, dive into relationships, man. Like, I like I understood that it maybe if it helps me if I can be able to talk to multiple different people and if I can pull one thing from that guy, if I can pull one thing from this guy, That way I don't have to lean on just myself. I think a lot of the problem today is, especially as men, when you feel alone and you have to feel like you do it all yourself and it's an ego thing. But at the same time, I think it's an African-American thing, too, that sometimes, you know, when we don't have another one with us, we feel lost. Right. And I think it was important for me to go get different perspectives. That way I can build off of that foundation on my own. Man, that's that's crazy. It's awesome. Let me switch gears because you have so much going on. And like I said, we could go to so many different directions, but you have really got into this media thing. You have really <laughs> dug in to this media thing. And I, and I was joking on your intro and said you were vlogging before vlogging is cool because you were vlogging several years ago on your travels and uh, you and your wife, your lovely wife yeah. and on your family. Um, have you always been interested in media? Um, what what gave you the motivation, the idea to be like, let's document our lives, especially overseas? And then how, how did, you know, what is all of this has led to kind of where you are now, podcasting, MLB, ESPN. Tell me your journey mm-hmm. in media. Man, it's been crazy. Like, I think, you know, you mentioned the Korea thing. My wife started a YouTube then. We love to document our travels, our experiences. Um, and I think one of the biggest reasons is because, like, I, I think in order for, and I think I got this from my dad, too, because he, like, document everything with that old video camera. Oh, just that's all the time dope. would be like, here, like all you, the, yes, all a the lot, time. A lot of games on there, I'm sure. So, yeah, exactly. So I think one thing is ha- having those memories and knowing that there's people that you can you can build an authentic community with that love those sharing those experiences with you. And I think once you start to realize, like, man, somebody's actually waiting for this video, like fri- every Friday, somebody's waiting for this video. Like, but that's cool to know that they support you. So that was something really cool. And then realizing 
I can do the same in the media sense with young players, young people that I want to give back to. Like, I want to give all the information about the game that I learned and more back to a, a young generation. I can do that via social media. I can do that via media on TV, MLB network, uh, radio, ESPN, whatever it may be. I can do that just by talking about the game. Like how many people can say that they can do all those things and give back to a community just by talking about something that they love. So I realized that that was something that I was interested in a long time ago when I was a young, a young player in high school, my parents always pointed out to me, people that use their platform athletes that use their platforms in a certain way. And now just now I'm starting to understand why it is that you use the platform that you have. It's not for you. It's for everybody else. Oh. And so where are we now? Again, you've got podcast upon podcast. You've uh, you've done some <laughs> you've done some MO, you've done some ESPN work for the KBO. Yeah. And some yeah. other things. Um, where are we now? What, 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 what's the goal? Where where do we want to take this? Uh, what do you enjoy doing the most? Because you've got business ventures, you've got media ventures. Uh, yeah. wh- where do we go? And what do you what do you enjoy? Like, what do you enjoy the best? Honestly, I don't know yet. Just because I'm just, you mentioned, I'm just touching the surface. Like, last year, I just started doing this thing. Oh, so I love like, it. I love I love, it. I love, I love, like, radio, love TV. I, I definitely think my face needs to be on TV. But, <laughs> <laughs> but no, I just like talking about these different issues, these get the games, things outside of just the numbers, right? Um, and, and I think I bring a different perspective. Uh, but one thing I do know is that, I want to be able to share um, all of these things with with the community that's been built um, within the game of baseball, but then also the community uh, that I love to associate myself with. And that's people that just want to learn. You know, I just I want to learn more about everything. And if I can be able to be a part of a community like that and do it via media, I, I want to do that. Talk to me about extraordinary athletes. Um, this is your business venture. Um, I know that you put a lot of time and resources into that as well. Um, and like you said, it's not your typical um, business or organization. It, it is definitely focused on giving back, but giving back in a different way. How did you get involved? Tell, tell me a little about what, what the goal is with it. Yeah. Extraordinary athletes. That's, that's the baby, man. That's uh that's something that kind of came out of nowhere. I knew my time was about done playing. And after 2019, 2020, I wanted to give back and, and do a camp. Um, but I did a camp in San Diego and I just realized that wasn't enough. Like I need to do more. And it kind of evolved into um, wanting to do a facility, an athletic facility that focused more on the mental side of things, um, then 2020 hit, uh, wasn't the right time for that, of course. And then figured, how can I do this media wise? So I started the podcast, Extraordinary Athletes Podcast on deck with X. Um, and then kind of talking about the sports industry, talking about the mental side of things, talking about perseverance, motivation, determination. And then ultimately, I wanted to I wanted to give athletes a way for them to be able to ha- understand how to use their own platform because I was learning during that time. I, I said, maybe extraordinary athletes can help athletes how to learn how to use their platform and be successful outside of their sport. And now today we've evolved into uh, working uh, with agencies and, and helping them learn how to teach their players how to use social media. Um, So whether that be graphics, whether that be video, whether that be written content, we're helping them with that, helping individual athletes with all of those things, um, including NIL athletes. So just being able to mentor athletes and consult athletes on how to use that platform. That's fantastic. The voice you are hearing, ladies and gentlemen, is Xavier Shrugs. Uh, They call him X. He is uh, uh, just doing so many amazing, amazing things. Before we get you out of here, X, we're gonna to- we're gonna do some. Look, you thought you were on the spot before. We're gonna do some quick hitting. But you're on the spot. I think some of my most exciting questions, but they'll be they'll be in a kind of a more of a rapid fire Ooh. Um, Ooh. segment. If you're ready to go, I'm ready, man. Bring it. I've noticed through through following your amazing social media. Everybody, make sure you follow X on all the social media platforms. But I noticed that you gave one of your sons 
a notorious B.I.G. birthday party. <laughs> yes. You know, this is I'm telling you, we're coming hard. We're coming in hot. Yeah. Top three yeah. MCs. Not you know, of your personal favorite, not like who you think are the greatest of all time. Who are uh, some, three of your personal favorite MCs? Yeah, Jay Z, uh, Biggie, and a, a newer age, but not not newer to the younger crowd right now. J Cole. Okay, uh, you know you went heavy East Coast. Yeah, you I went, did. And for somebody from San Diego, it could be blasphemous. <laughs> could be, <laughs> but I, I I respect that. Um, best baseball movie of all time. Ah, man. I love Major League, man. I love Major Ooh. League. Yeah, there's a lot of them out there. I love I, I just something about Major League, man. The funny, the funny ones. Uh, <laughs> the, the first one, basically. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got you. I got you. Major League was great as a classic. Uh, I'm going to go. I, I always there's a movie that nobody ever like doesn't know. It's not as well known. But there's a movie called Long Gone. Have you ever seen? Have you ever heard of this movie? No, I don't think so. Long gone. Um, uh, guys, he's, I think it was William Peterson, the guy from CSI, played a uh, stud Cantrell, and uh, uh, Dylan McDermott, I think, or somebody like played. It, it's it is inappropriate. It's <laughs> it's a they're a uh, they're a minor league baseball team back uh, like in, in I guess in the forties, like um, wow. And it's um and it's completely inappropriate, but it is uh I'll check it out. It's it's hilarious. It's it is hilarious. Uh and then obviously gotta give a nod to Black History with Bingo Long traveling all stars mm-hmm. with um yep. Billy D. Williams and James Earl yes. Jones. Yep. That that's, that's that solid. that one gets better as you get older because you understand more you of what start to doing. understand it a little bit more, yeah. Then, All then right. you understand why your pops was watching. Exactly, because it's great. All right, couple couple more hard hitting ones. Mm. Uh most and I think you've done this for under twenty five on your social media, but most exciting player in the game right now. You know, no age limit. Most exciting player in the game. Shohei Otani, the most exciting oh, player in the he's game so right good. now. <laughs> he's so good. You're exact. You're. I think you had uh, uh what was it? Tatis two. Shohei number yeah, one. Yeah, Tatis was up there. I had a Ronald Acuna Jr. Yeah. Oh uh, man, there's so many exciting players right game's now. In, game's in a good spot. Uh, most unique teammate most unique teammate you've ever been teammates most with most unique teammate right just uh, completely not, i'm not you can tell me why they're unique but the most unique yeah. team most unique teammate i got two of them right i got randall gritchuk he's from like a smaller town in texas um it was almost like he's he's with the the blue jays now but we were roommates for a while in 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 uh minor leagues and in and we played together in the big leagues but just like i mean you would have no idea that this guy was a baseball player, just like he, not even thinking about baseball, just like more concerned about how his hair looks in the morning for an hour long. Uh, you know, didn't didn't realize how strong he was. It was just one of those one of those funny guys. And then uh, Tommy Pham, a guy that I played with for a long time sure. in the Cardinals organization. Uh, just a character like this guy needs his own show because um, it, just the way he approaches life in general, because he's from Vegas. So he naturally thinks he's like a pimp. He thinks like he's a Vegas <laughs> pimp. So it's like, it's funny to watch him about his business. Toughest picture you've ever faced. Toughest picture I've ever faced. Probably man, Bartolo Colon was kind of tough for me, like, Ooh. because like in it, this was like he was almost done, but he just had like so much. <laughs> I was just saying, how old was, how old yeah, was Bartolo? He was, like, probably close to 40. And he had so much movement just on his 90 mile an hour fastball. I'm like, this is like an invisible. I can't hit this pitch right now. <laughs> All right. I would, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to go back to, to, to a little bit of a serious question um, because I think it's important for our audience to know. And it's uh, important because you also um, I've seen you speak about uh, your, your kind of faith walk in several, um, several different interviews. And and it's always something that I think um, whenever I get the chance to talk to athletes um, about kind of their journey in faith and how they've leaned on it. um, We hear more and more today, every day about uh, player athletes with mental health. Um, You know, we leagues focusing on mental health, anxiety, stress, depression, all kinds of things. Um, you've made it, um, you know, you made it a, a, a point to speak in public about being a dedicated man of faith. How does that, 
how do you represent that as as you go on to you know mentor folks and and, and be in these spaces and work on such important issues like diversity and equity in the game um what role does that that faith journey for you play in yeah, it's it's the ultimate priority. Um, I do everything I do because of my faith. So it, as long as I understand that, you know, I can be a light to every single person, um, you know, I may not be a light to every single person, but as long as I'm able to un- to give people an understanding of this is who I am and this is why I'm this way, um, I feel like I'm doing what what's necessary and I, and i think a lot of times we define ourselves by the role that we have or the role that we take whether that be being an athlete whether that be being an entrepreneur whether that be whatever job you have like i never wanted to define myself as that like i wanted my faith to define me and as long as i understand that you know it's it, it may rub people the wrong way um, but my goal is not to, to, you know, force my faith on anybody. I want people to see by the way that I walk, um, that there's something different about me. And I want them to understand that those, that, that thing that's different is, is my faith. It's God. It's having the, the presence, um, in my life. And I want people to be, um, a, a part of that. I want people to know that joy. And if I can be able to allow them to see that in me, then, then, I know that I'm doing my job. I know that I'm making this place better. Um, I know that I'm giving, giving off, um, you know, everything that I've learned to to somebody else, not just physically or mentally, but like spiritually, that's where I'm at right now. And, and I feel like that's more important than anything because we don't know how much time we have on this earth. And, um, and if we're not living our life to the fullest, uh, spiritually, then, then what are we doing? We're wasting time. So, um, that's what I'm all about. And, and that's the priority. And I'm very glad you asked me about that because none of this stuff that we talked about is capable of happening without the man upstairs. No, I appreciate the answer where, and this will be the last one, even though I have several more, but I'll, this will be the last one. Where do you see yourself as you move forward next two, three, five, uh, years and you know because you, again you've got business you've got media you've got consulting roles uh where do you see yourself going uh kind of in the next couple of years and don't mention you're you're a father of two and a husband <laughs> three. So you got a, I'm a father three. Of three. Oh, three. Oh, sorry. so is it, is it three boys or two boys two boys two boys and i got a baby girl that's oh five man months. congratulations so yeah so congratulations Thank so oh man so where do you see yourself going in the next couple of years I don't know, man. <laughs> like, I, like honestly, I know people say that they don't know. Like, oh, but I, really, I really don't know because one of the reasons is because that God has given me a lot of different avenues right now. And I'm yeah. trying to figure navigate which one is best for me or which ones that I can take on that allows me to keep my family a priority. And, and you know, making sure that I'm using my time wisely while still respecting the fact that um, I have three kids to raise as well as a wife to, to make sure that she feels like she's of the m- utmost importance. Um, so I think that that kind of allows me to sit back and say the, the sky's the limit, man. The sky's the limit in figuring out, navigating which way to go. Whatever way it is, I want to be able to impact a large audience of people, um, you know, by by my words, by my actions, by uh by audio, by video, all those things, because I think we're in a day and age now to where we can do a lot of things and impact more people than we've ever had the ability to impact before. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it is definitely needed. And I will tell you, I think Xavier Shrugs is a wonderful, wonderful person, vehicle, however you want to say it, to bridge the gap between Major League Baseball, baseball in general, a game that we really love and connecting it to culture, to young black players in particular um, that would probably want to be would would probably be great baseball players, want to be baseball players, want to have those resources. Um, And so he's he is one of the like I said at the beginning of the interview, one of the reasons why I think it's so important is because I do think there's an element of attracting making the game attractive to our community 
Um, and we need people that can talk about the game in a way that culture understands. Yeah. And we don't have enough of them. They don't highlight them. They don't find them enough. They don't put them in places where they can be elevated. And Xavier has done that through his media, through his platforms, through all the platforms that he's given. Um, and he does it so authentically and he does it so naturally. So I will be watching the next two, three, five. Hopefully we'll have you on again, sir. Um, yeah. But I'll be watching because um, you, you, you are on to something that I think can actually help change the landscape of the game. So, I appreciate that. Man. I appreciate, appreciate it, that. brother. Uh, I wish you the best of luck. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Cheats Movement podcast. We will be right back after this.